Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I am Dr. Jeremy Pettis, Leslie Island, Steve Edelman. We're all adult endocrinologists, all living with type 1 diabetes. And we're really excited to do this session, which is going to be on times in our lives that we've used type 1 diabetes to our advantage, or something positive has, you know, kind of come from type 1 diabetes. So if you follow us at TCOID, seen some of our old content, we actually did this, this talk, if you will, where we reenacted kind of type 1 horror stories. There was a time that Steve was caught in an elevator with a bad low and a time that he had an Omnipod that was caused like some gushing bleeding everywhere. Check those videos out. So people are related to those for sure. But for this, we thought, gosh, let's take a positive spin on it and think about moments in our lives where we really kind of were very thankful we had type 1. Maybe we use it to our advantage. So to, to kick it off, Steve has a, a great story, which is a lot of fun, that we're going to hear him, you know, tell, and then we're going to relive it through Steve's eyes. So Steve, kick us off. So this, this is when I was an undergraduate at UCLA, probably around 1980. I had a Datsun pickup truck with mag wheels, little white pinstriping like flames, a fiberglass camper shell that just fit the body. <laughs> I'm loving this already. <laughs> I was driving on the freeway. At that time, the speed limit was 55. And I was going well over 70. So anyway, I'm driving along. I'm still speeding. I got pulled over by a CHP officer. I don't know if I've ever been pulled over before. So I was super nervous. I look in my side mirror. I see him walking towards me. <laughs> He's got the belt, the badge, the sunglasses. It, it scared me. <laughs> So I rolled down my window, no electric back then, he sticks his head in and says to me, did you know you were speeding? So I say, yes, officer, I know. He says you were going 75 and a 55. Any reason why you were going so fast? So I say, sir, I have type one diabetes. I take insulin, my blood sugar's low. I need to get off the freeway to get something to drink or eat so I can bring it back up. Now, just to be clear, I wasn't low. You just made it up. Absolutely. I did not want to get a ticket. <laughs> so the police officer looks at me for a second. And he goes, you have diabetes? Yes, I say. You're on insulin? Yes, I say. Can you still drive right now? Yes, sir, I can. He looks at me right in the eye and says, okay, I'll follow you. Great, now I gotta follow through on this whole story I made up. He walks back to his car, I drive off, and he starts to follow me. I get off at the next exit, and right there is a Denny's. So we both pull into Denny's, we both park our cars, I walk up to the front of Denny's, and there he is, staring at me. This particular Denny had an old school counter, so I sat down and ordered a Diet Coke, because I wasn't really low. <laughs> I'm sitting there drinking my Diet Coke. I look out the window. He gave me a little head nod and then got in his car, drove away. So do you think he actually believed you? You know what? I think he really did. <laughs> the way he asked me, you're a diabetic? And yeah, I think he did. And what year was it, did you say? 1980. And so, you know, there's probably no way he could even have confirmed it. Like, we didn't really have blood sugar meters then, certainly not a CGM, so... I was still here testing my urine at that time, believe it or not. <laughs> it, was, it was the perfect crime. There's no... <laughs> so, um, so, when did you think that you were going to say this? Do you remember? Like, have yeah. you thought about this previously? Like, hey, if I ever get pulled over or I'm just going to say I have diabetes, or, or yeah. did you think about it right then? Right then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as I was being pulled over. Yeah. I said... I, it just came to my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way I think. I don't really, you know me, I don't plan ahead yeah. more than one or two days. And uh, it just came to my mind. I said, I'm going for it. Yeah. Well, I would say for people watching, do not emulate this. Because if you tell somebody you have a blood sugar, first of all, they're going to look at it. And if it is low, then you can actually get like in trouble. You know, so Steve got away with this. And I think the point here is that sometimes diabetes works to our advantage. And specifically around like faking low blood sugars, that's something I would recommend everybody do at some point, you know, because if something that, you know, you, you don't really want to do, maybe you don't want to take out the garbage right now, maybe you're feeling a little low, you can do it in 10 minutes. There's some advantages there of playing the low blood sugar card. Like, I don't know, Leslie. You shouldn't be speeding either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's just, you know, times with your kids, you can just say like, I need a minute, yeah. you know, and then it's good. 
Yeah, and it, it works. Just, yeah, maybe they're just driving you crazy. It has nothing to do with your blood sugars, yeah. but just put that in your back pocket. So thanks for that story, Steve. That was great. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> was the cop good looking, by the way, or is he, do you remember? Um, he was, he was, he was handsome. Okay, good. All right. So you heard it here. Okay. <laughs> so now I think it's my turn. So my story um, is not like Steve's where he kind of took advantage of diabetes to beat the system. Mine's more <laughs> of like a positive story about how type 1 diabetes affected my life in a, in a very positive way and, and, and uh, how meaningful that was to me. So here goes. So let me take you back to a magical time of 2010. Katy Perry was turning up the heat on America with California girls. We met the delightful cast of Glee for the first time. And the phrase, like a G6, took a residency in our brains forever. It was also, however, the year that a young Jeremy Pettis met Steve Edelman. And the story goes like this. So I was doing my medical residency, which you guys know is your your post-medical training for new doctors. In my third year of residency, I was selected to be a chief resident, which is it's kind of an honor. So I know you guys know that I'm a big deal now, but this was <laughs> really a big deal then. So one of the reasons I wanted to be a chief resident is that it actually looks really good on your resume, and I actually wanted to be a cardiologist back then, if you can believe it. And cardiology is actually extremely competitive to get into. So I was definitely on a path to pursue a career that had nothing to do with diabetes. At any rate, part of the chief resident gig is that I had to give a big lecture in front of all the medical faculty called Grand Rounds. So this was super cool, but it was also super terrifying. So I've only been a doctor now for three years or so, so I'm thinking, what could I possibly be an expert on? So to avoid the scrutiny of my peers, I decided to do a history of medicine talk. That way I could actually research something, know a lot about it, and knock the socks off of my peers. So I spend the next few weeks in bed, you know, lying awake at night, just wondering what I should talk about, and then it hit me. I'll do a talk on the history of type 1 diabetes. So I asked around my friends, you know, who should I talk to that's on faculty to get some insight into this, this topic? And they all said, Steve Edelman. Steve Edelman. Steve Edelman. So I set out to find this white whale of diabetes knowledge, Dr. Steve Edelman. Which strangely, after being at UCSD for three years, I had never actually met Steve Edelman. And Steve still finds that hard to believe. So I sat down on my computer and I drafted up a beautiful email to Dr. Edelman. I told him my life story, how passionate I was about type 1 diabetes, how excited I would to be meeting him, and how I could really use his help, you know, making this type 1 talk. I hit send and I knew in my heart I had just drafted a masterpiece. And I didn't have to wait long to see that I actually had a reply from him in my inbox. And I'm expecting this response to be an equally impassioned, you know, meaningful response that was just complimenting me for my initiative to do something good for people in the world with diabetes. But I open up the message and it just says, VA clinic, 2 p.m. Tuesday. So not quite the response I was expecting, but you know, hell yeah, things are coming together. <laughs> So, you know, sure enough, Tuesday rolls around and I'm there early. I'm there at 1.55, ready to go. But in classic Steve style, I get to this clinic and there's just a whirlwind of events happening. So he was talking to two other residents about a diabetes case. He was answering texts. He was conducting emails and tying his shoes somehow all at the same time. I mean, it was a scene. So I kind of awkwardly walk up and I say, hey, Dr. Edelman, I'm Jeremy Pettis. It's nice to meet you. Who? He said, yeah, I wrote you an email about my Grand Rounds talk and I thought that, oh yeah, you have type one, right? Are you on a CGM? A CG what? I said. A CG what? Holy f This guy doesn't know what a CGM is. So suddenly I'm back in third grade PE class and I can't climb the damn rope and everybody's laughing at me. I would have sworn everybody in that VA clinic burst into laughter about my lack of diabetes knowledge. So now keep in mind, it's 2010. And I mean, how many of you people watching were on a CGM way back then? Probably not that many. So it's not like I was a complete cave dweller. Anyway, he starts asking me some follow-up questions. What insulin pump do you use? A pump, you say? Yeah, I'm, 
I use regular and NPH. And at this point, he's somewhere between laughing and fainting. And it's, it was full on pandemonium now in this clinic room. He says, regular and NPH? You take your insulin while you're playing your Game Boy? How's your Sony Walkman holding up? Oh, regular and NPH, that is rich. So this goes on for three, four hours, and then Steve finally regains his composure so we can have an actual conversation. Sorry for busting your chops, Rook. Let me help you get set up. Thanks, I said. So he proceeds to introduce me to a Dexcom rep, and the very next day, I had a CGM on. He also got me on a pump in the next couple weeks, and I was off to the races. After that, Steve and I started talking, you know, almost, almost daily. So he would talk to me about whatever had been happening with his diabetes that day, and it, it took me a while to figure out how to get a, a word in edgewise when you're talking to Steve. And at the end of these phone calls, I was always say to myself, next time, say something, Jeremy. Eventually I did, of course, and we became super good buds. And it didn't take long for him to convince me that endocrinology was where it was at, and honestly, he made a really good case. I had lived my type 1 life without really changing anything. And now there's new cool pumps, CGMs, new insulins. Suddenly I felt like a lot was happening and I had to be part of it. And I really owe it to Steve for showing that to me. I mean, my life would be completely different in so many ways if I didn't get absolutely roasted in that <laughs> diabetes clinic that day. <laughs> and what about that big grand rounds talk I had, you ask? Well, I completely crushed it, of course, but it had literally nothing to do with Steve because we never actually ever talked about it, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. You know, Jeremy, I remember that meeting like it was yesterday. It didn't go exactly as you described, but pretty darn close. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty accurate. So yeah, I, I think, you know, part of the point is that not everybody has a Steve Edelman in their lives, but, you know, there's a bond that comes out of meeting somebody else with type 1, and of course you shape my career and all that, but our friendship now has honestly very little to do with our career and a lot to do with just, you know, our just common bond that we share. So there is something really special and powerful that where you can use type one to your advantage of fostering these relationships. And Leslie yeah. is another example of that. By the way, she flew all the way here from Omaha to, to be here with us. So um, I don't know. What do you think? We're not taking I, out for a steak dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm jealous of this. I'm jealous of like the mentoring relationship and then the friend relationship that you guys have. And um, I didn't have anything like that. I feel like I'm I'm getting it now. But early on, I mean, I was diagnosed when I was 25, my last year of medical school, and so you know I never went to camp. And and the only people I knew with diabetes were the people that I was admitting to the hospital. And so it took me a while until I found that niche that I was looking for. Yeah. You're part of the group now. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, you <laughs> showed this picture like earlier of like, you know, there was like six or eight of us type one endocrinologists that got together at this meeting. And mm -hmm. like, that's that actually is really special. It's probably my favorite thing when we travel is to meet like, you know, with our other type one friends. Absolutely. You get it like a pass of just being automatically cool to have <laughs> type one diabetes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So speaking of that, now we have a, a talk or I think it's your turn, Leslie. Yeah. So when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, my doctors weren't quite sure what to do with me. I was 25, I was a little older, I wasn't really symptomatic, I just had this abnormal fasting blood sugar. So my provider at the time at, from Student Health decided to get more information and ordered me a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. <laughs> and if you've ever had one of these, you know that they really suck. First you have to fast overnight, and then you have to go to the lab and drink this disgusting, thick, orange liquid. And then you sit in a waiting room for two hours and try not to throw up. I distinctly remember sitting in the waiting room watching the movie High Fidelity on my super cool iPod Touch. And I was just so nauseous and also just really worried about what the results of this test were going to mean for me and the rest of my life. So, of course, we know the results of that test. Turns out I have type 1 diabetes. Um, and really, it comes into play years later uh, when I'm pregnant with my first child and it turns out I don't actually have to do that oral glucose tolerance test to see if I have gestational diabetes. I had so many friends who were pregnant at the time and just really stressed over having to do that test during their second trimester. And I certainly sympathize with all of them, but I was just so relieved not to have to do that again. So that's maybe not a great example of using type 1 to your advantage, but I think it's just a way to, uh, it just tells the story of like, you need to look for the wins wherever you can find them. Leslie, during those two hours, we were waiting for the second test. Were you really concerned about the rest of your life? 
Yeah, I was. And I like was a little bit in denial about it probably. Because you're saying later, you know, you would see these people, what would you think, waiting for the results, you know? Yeah, when I was pregnant, uh, my two boys are a year and a half apart. So I had two pregnancies back to back and I would walk down the hall to my appointments um, and there would be this little room off to the lab where other women were sitting, like doing their test, waiting for the results. And every time I would just walk by and be like, that's not me. <laughs> and it was just a little, little silver lining every time I walked by that room. Well, you, you definitely have to, you know, take the wins. You were saying at the time that you... Yeah, it, you know what? I mean, on a similar vein, <laughs> not as serious, but it's true that when I get hit up by Girl Scout, when girls want to sell me Girl Scout cookies, I just look at them straight in the eye and go, I have diabetes, I can't eat cookies, and I put my head like that, <laughs> and then that's it. I'm out of there. You walk away. <laughs> yeah. So once again, Stephen's example of a time that he's kind of abused type one diabetes. <laughs> uh, no, but I think this is important, like, Poor you know, girls. taking these, like, you know, the wins, because type one is, it's a slog, you know, let's be honest, that you work your butt off all the time to try to control your blood sugars, and what are we working so hard for? Nothing. That is our goal. We want nothing to happen. That is a win, not a high, not a low, no complications, and it's hard to just work all the time for nothing. So you got to stop and <laughs> celebrate the little wins, yeah. even if it's not drinking like orange goop. Like that's a good thing. Let's a make, you know celebrate that. Maybe Steve gets to shame some Girl Scouts. That's a win <laughs> for him too. But you know other little things that we talk about. You know being able to get a free national park pass because you have type one diabetes. Um, you know I was going to tell a story about when I was in college. I was able to get on the, the, the disabled students program, which I hate that word, um, but it had all kinds of services that I could take advantage of, and people should you know do that too. So there's definitely some little like actual practical like things that maybe we can you know pat ourselves on the back of, take advantage of, and move on. Okay, so I think we have time for one more story. So back to Steve, take it away. Yeah, well, I went to med school at UC Davis, graduated in 1982. I delivered the valedictory at the commencement uh, activities, and I worked on that lecture for six weeks. And I had never listened to the lecture. A friend of mine, taped it on a cassette tape in the front row. Uh, I converted it to a CD and just sat there for 35 years. My daughter said, Dad, I want to hear that. So we played it together and I heard it for the first time. And while listening, you know, I didn't remember too much about it, but I did remember that when I was listening that I actually started talking about, uh, I told the whole crowd I had diabetes and I was proud of it. I thought that was kind of goofy. But then I went on to say that any uh, individual with a chronic disease needs to be educated about their condition and it's also important to educate their loved ones and to and to take a positive attitude about your chronic condition and so in retrospect you know that's sort of the thinking around taking control of your diabetes and why I started that and believe it or not you know 1995 so we wanted to play a little clip for you and you can hear the beginnings of taking control of your diabetes over 40 years ago. I have had diabetes for 11 years, and I am proud of it. Having a chronic condition has made me more appreciative of good life, health, and people for what they are. Having diabetes has helped me steer my career goal towards endocrinology, a field in which I will be dealing with people afflicted with the same condition. With my personal experience and desire, I feel I can offer special insight in this field of medicine. It was difficult to learn about the chronic complications of diabetes and the depressing morbidity and mortality statistics. It was depressing and difficult to see other diabetics who had had diabetes just a little longer than myself who were blind, required real dialysis, and suffered from peripheral and autonomic neuropathy. These are problems I must overcome and help others overcome. It is so very important to have a positive attitude, be educated about your condition, and to communicate with others with a similar problem. Patient clients much better when they know what is going on, and they feel they have some control over the situation. People should never feel imposing or timid in asking their condition questions. Ignorance can be disastrous. Communicating with others afflicted with the same condition, discussing and sharing their own experiences and ways in which they cope with the problems is invaluable. There is so much unnecessary fear, guilt, and anxiety that can be alleviated by listening to others with the same problem. Virtually everybody has or will have some type of health problem, some more chronic than others, 
but it is so important to learn to adjust your problems and actually use them to your advantage. So what qualities make an excellent physician? Medical knowledge, empathy, patience, understanding, and a special sense that gives one the ability to deal and treat with people as equal individuals, to adapt one's own lifestyle and personal style to every person so that they will have an excellent understanding of their problem and have a positive, realistic attitude. Wow, Steve, that was awesome. I had never heard that before and seeing this like time span of everything that's happened at TCO80. I mean, talk about the ultimate example of taking a bad situation and making it positive, specifically taking type 1 diabetes and making something good out of it, not just for yourself, but for the millions of people that you've touched and TCO80 has touched over the years. Um, gosh, it's just so great to see how you can just turn that into something positive and everybody that's watching there has been shaped by Steve Edelman by TCOID so thank you Steve for and that yeah. that idea has been kind of incubating in you for so long for yeah. 40 years ago that's you know yeah, yeah. thank incredible. you so much yeah so you know that was really inspiring to see and hopefully it's an inspiring you all doesn't mean you have to go out and create TCOID there's only one Steve Edelman but gosh there are some real silver linings of, of having type 1 so um, you know thanks again for watching this is going to stick with me for a bit in a good way. Um, you know, too. We'll hope to see you soon. And just remember, don't lie to police officers and <laughs> buy some Girl Scout cookies every once in a while and have a fantastic day.